And good evening, Lincoln County community members. Thank you for joining us this evening as part of our Lincoln County Wildfire Readiness Presentations. This evening will be the conclusion of our six-part series of our Wildfire Readiness Presentations. Tonight, we will be discussing air quality considerations during wildfire season and access and functional needs preparedness. So those individuals that may have access and functional needs and their preparedness efforts. I am not joined by any guests tonight. Uh, it will just be me and I am Jenny Damaris, your county emergency manager. So with that, we will get started. Okay, there we go. So as I referenced, this is the sixth part of our six part series. Uh, in prior years, when we were able to be with you in person, we had this presentation in a two hour time frame. So it was sort of A to Z all the way through of the information we wanted to present to you for wildfire readiness. But with COVID conditions and not being able to be with you in person, we determined that it was a better use of our time and accessibility for you, the public, by splitting these topics into six individual session. So we have done that. However, tonight we're actually combining air quality and access and functional needs within this time slot. So as we go through our presentation slides tonight, some of you may have joined us as an actual attendee and you'll be able to ask questions of me by dropping those questions in the chat box. Some of you may be watching this on our Lincoln County Sheriff's Office live stream video, or some of you may be watching this at a later date on our recorded video. At any time that you have questions, feel free to email me or any of the resources that we have outlined in the presentation today. You can also just look at the slides themselves um, without watching the video. And if you do that, when you click on graphics or hyperlinks, this is intended to be a self-learning module so that as you go through the slides, if you want more information related to that specific area, you can click on it and it will take you to that resource that we found to create this presentation. So to get us started, we're going to talk about air quality considerations during wildfire season. We're going to do a little bit of an administrative overview for both this presentation and the access and functional needs. And then we'll talk about resources. And for those of you that may be joining us as an attendee, we'll have plenty of time to ask questions. So for air quality, we're going to talk about the composition of wildfire smoke, air monitoring resources here in Lincoln County and across the state, wildfire smoke and health risks to you, wildfire smoke and animals, the risks that they may have, those additional resources, and then questions. So our administrative, administrative brief and sponsors. So who are those wildfire advocates? Well, most emergencies start with a call to our 911 dispatch center. They then route our fire EMS and law enforcement responders to us at the emergency. And then sometimes individuals in that disaster emergency are taken to our area local hospital, Samaritan North Lincoln, Samaritan Pacific. And then when the event is concluded, public works and utility providers and road departments help put everything back the way it was before the event has occurred. Our public health partners help us in other avenues such as environmental health, behavioral health, and communicable disease outbreaks such as we have experienced with our COVID-19 response. Your elected officials are very important as they ensure access to state and federal resources when your first responders and utility services need them. Your emergency operations centers for city, county, and tribal work with all of these partners and agencies to ensure the resources that they need and public information is taken care of. So community presentation sponsors, your Lincoln County Fire Defense Board, which is made up of each of our fire districts here in Lincoln County, Oregon Department of Forestry, your Lincoln County Public Health Department, our good friends with the American Red Cross, Oregon State University Extension Service, Oregon Coast Community College for their Small Business Administration, and Oregon State Department of Financial Regulation with their Consumer and Business Services. And lastly, your Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. So what is the objective of the presentations? Why are we doing these? Well, if you've attended our Cascadia presentations in the past, you'll notice that this objective is very similar. Our goal is to strengthen your knowledge of our local wildfire risk here in Lincoln County and across Oregon and your role in preparedness, response, and recovery. And along the way, we're also going to outline what our role of public government is to you. 
So to start off with wildfire spoke composition. So just to be clear, I'm not a subject matter expert on air quality, but what I have done is a good job of finding these resources and trying to articulate um, how they apply in this circumstance. Again, if you were to click on this graphic, it's actually going to lead you to a source that will get you that additional information. So composition of wildfire smoke. Wildfire smoke is a complex mixture of gases and particles that interact and change as they move away from the fire. Of all the pollutants in wildfire smoke, fine particulate matter referenced as a PM 2.5 poses the greatest risk to human health. The microscopic soot particles can be inhaled deep into the lungs where they may cause inflammation and irritation. Volatile organic compounds and other gases can also irritate the eyes, nose, throat, and lungs. And I'm sure many of you that were here in September of last year for our Lincoln County Echo Mountain Fire or may have been affected by other smoke that moved in from the valley and even as far as way as Washington or California. So here's that picture again. I like this one because it does kind of define that. So you see that the tree is on fire and as they referenced in the narrative, as they move away from the fire, that particulate matter or PM, volatile organic compounds and other gases interact in the atmosphere to form secondary particles and gases such as ozone. So you can see that how they're breaking that down for us. And then there's going to be another picture here down at the bottom. It shows that human hair for scale. I've got another graphic that will take that a little bit more into detail. So that particulate matter, what's the basics? So PM stands for that particulate matter, also called particula particular pollution, the term for a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found in the air. Some particles such as dust, dirt, soot, or smoke or large, are large or dark enough to be seen with the naked eye. Others are so small they can only be detected using an electron microscope. So the particular pollution includes PM10 inhalable particulate particulars with diameters that are generally 10 micrometers or smaller, PM 2.5 fine in inhalable particles with diameters that are generally 2.5 micrometers and smaller. So how small is 2.5 micrometers? Think about a single hair from your head. The average human hair is about 70 micrometers in diameter, making it 30 times larger than the largest fine particle. And this information was referenced directly from the EPA. So here's a better graphic where it shows that. So there's your human hair and the size, the microns that they reference. Uh, down in the bottom, they're showing you an actually uh, one granular of fine beach sand. And then, uh, move my mouse out of the way, uh, there's that dust, pollen, mold, et cetera. Many of are experiencing allergies this season. I know my household sure is. We're really, even the cats and dogs are having issues. And then up above, the combustion particles, organic compounds, metals, et cetera. So it kind of gives you a point of reference of all that stuff that may be inhaled into our lungs and then cause irritation. Or if you happen to be an individual um, that is vulnerable to this, it may have an even greater effect on you. So air monitoring resources. How do we know what the quality of our air actually is? Well, there are monitoring that is throughout the state of Oregon, but I will let you know there are currently no active air monitoring resources that are available to the public or for us to use here in Lincoln County. So when you think about our air quality and how it's monitored and the information that we get, we actually draw that from our regional area, not specifically here to Lincoln County. So this page is actually demonstrating to us Oregon Department of Forestry. They do have an Oregon Department of Forestry prescribed burns. So when an individual or an entity applies for a burning permit through the Oregon Department of Forestry, that information is loaded into this website and you can actually track when those fires are taking place, their locations, and any other information specific to that burn pit. This, the reason why I put this here is we have many community members that say to us, you know, I'm very much affected by smoke. How can I stay informed of these conditions? So this is one way you could just monitor it every day, uh, look and see where those prescribed burns are, and then determine what the weather is and whether or not that may affect you or your geographical area. So Oregon Smoke Information Blog. So you can subscribe to up 
updates on your mobile phone or email uh, to this particular site. So it's access uh, current air quality information from the Department of Equality, DEQ, and learn if there's a health advisory in your community. And you'll notice across the top, you can't really see here, maybe my mouse will show you, they have additional tabs up here, like um, air quality forecasting, fire info. This also could be very beneficial to individuals that um, are able to take vacations to other areas, but you may be affected by that air quality. So if, if you are one of those individuals, this could really be part of your pre-planning or your trip check, if you will, if you're traveling to somewhere else outside of Lincoln County. So air quality monitoring data, um, again, here is the Oregon Department of DEQ, and they have theirs color-coded green down to dark maroon, which is hazardous. The date that I actually took this snapshot, there was great air quality um, across the state of Oregon, but as we move further into fire season and we see more of our sister um, counties having fires, then you'll see that these color code areas are in and around those uh, populated areas. So air quality index, what do all those colors mean? So here's a graph that will also outline for you the hazardous category and more uh, clearly define uh, what that actually means. And then they also have applied that numerical value so that you can look to see, um, it says values above 500 are considered beyond the AQI, follow recommendations for hazardous category. So again, click on this and it will take you directly to that link. And what you might think about doing is actually bookmarking this information on your mobile device, your iPad, your computer at home, so you don't have to try and find it again. But if you do want to find it, if you go to our Lincoln County Emergency Management webpage under uh, current conditions, you will find this there waiting for you. So DEQ subscribe for updates. Again, here's another option that you could subscribe to get updated information. And I think once you go through the um, subscribe process, it may actually ask you for a geographical area that you are interested in. So Lincoln County current conditions. Look here. Uh, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. So here's our current conditions page for alerts and warnings. And you'll notice uh, prescribed burns are right here, air quality, tides, drought, volcano, weather alerts, National Weather Service, 911 when to call, the river levels, road conditions, anything that you would need or that is fed of live information to us for us to use for the public, we have included here. And if by chance you happen to find something else I'm not aware of and you think it would be value to our community, let me know and we'll add it to our page. So wildfire smoke and health risks. So this is information from your Oregon Health Authority and your Lincoln County Public Health. Wildfire smoke in your health from the Oregon Health Authority. Populations with increased risk. Just as I referenced earlier, if you are an individual that know um, that you are susceptible to air quality conditions that could affect you, such as sensitive groups that may have pre-existing heart, respiratory disease, or allergies, um, seniors, infants, children, or even sometimes healthy subjects can also be affected, but some may not. There's also vulnerable groups, those working or living downwind of smoke, and then those individuals that have labored breathing, so meaning they do a physical activity outside for their professional job, or it even could be athletes that are outside exercising, and during those conditions, they could be more greatly affected. So what are the impacts of wildfire smoke? What, what can it actually do to you? And I just want to reference the picture that's here. This is actually Baker County. Uh, when uh, Sheriff's leadership allowed me to be deployed over to Baker County several years ago, the first big fire I went on to kind of learn how fire went. And so this was a picture that I took when we were in the canyon uh, surveilling the area. So this is a real uh, Oregon picture. So breathing in smoke can affect you right away, causing coughing, trouble breathing, wheezing, asthma attacks could be um, uh, exasperated by this, stinging eyes, scratchy throat, runny nose, irritated sinuses, headaches, tiredness, chest pain, and even a fast heartbeat. You may see that many of these are also directly related to your allergy season symptoms, but please know the difference that when you are in smoky conditions, that is going to potentially have a more lasting effect on you. So be ready to protect yourself against smoke and ash before, during, and after a wildfire. And this information is from the CDC. So recommendations for everyone, pay attention to local air quality reports. 
try to keep yourself informed. If you are someone that will affect you or another family member, staying apprised of that, of that information, changing weather conditions uh, would benefit you. Refer to the visibility guides if they are available, just like that picture I showed you of Baker County. That was really my very, very first experience of being in a community or in an environment where really you're looking down the road and it's hard to see. It's like fog. And you're like, boy, you just really never realized how thick that smoke could be unless you have been around it. Of course, here in Lincoln County last year with our Labor Day fires, uh, many of the community members were greatly affected from smoke coming in from other areas around our south and central county. And then, of course, the north end of the county was very affected by our Echo Mountain fire. So if you're advised to stay indoors, keep indoor, uh, keep your indoor air as clean as possible. So keep your windows and doors closed unless it's extremely hot outside. Run an air conditioner if you have one, but keep the fresh air intake closed and the filter clean to prevent outdoor smoke from getting inside. Uh, consider running a high efficiency particulate air filter, such as a HEPA filter or an electrostatic precipitator, an ESP, can also help you keep your indoor air clean. If you do not have an air conditioner, and it is too warm to stay inside with the windows closed, then you may need to consider seeking a shelter elsewhere. And by that, we mean if you um, have health conditions that um, are aggravated by the smoke, then that may be an individual that needs to seek shelter somewhere else. That could be going to another community. Uh, depending how, how many of our population are here, we may try to open up a sort of clean air shelters, if you will, to help those individuals that are greatly affected. Uh, do not add to indoor pollution. When smoke levels are high, don't use anything that burns, uh, such as candles, fireplaces, or gas stoves. Don't vacuum because vacuuming actually stirs up the part the particles already inside your home. Don't smoke because smoking puts even more pollution into the air. Do not rely on masks for protection. For more information about effective masks, see the respiratory fact sheet. And I've got a slide later in to, uh, to reference for that for you. So recommendations for people with chronic diseases. Have an adequate supply of medication more than five days. If you have asthma, make sure you do have a written asthma management plan and your family knows how to implement that for you. If you uh, not just your family, but maybe also your coworkers. If you have a heart disease, check with your healthcare providers about precautions to take. If you have, uh, if you plan to use a portable air cleaner, select a high efficiency partic <laughs> particulate air HEPA filter. And then buy one that matches the room size specify, specified by the manufacturer. And then contact your healthcare provider if your condition gets worse when you become exposed to smoke. So what things can you do? Try to reduce the time that you do spend outdoors. Reduce the time that you engage in vigorous outdoor activity. Stay hydrated, plenty of fresh water. Reduce other sources of indoor smoke and dust. And if you're advised to stay indoors, again, try to keep that indoor air clean. Oregon Health Authority resources. I would say that they have a, a most excellent website directly for the topic that we're here on tonight. Um, I'm going to show you the next several slides, some of those resources they do make available to you. Um, hazy smoky air, what to do, wildfire smoke in your health, air cleaners, and do-it-yourself air, fil air filter, and then use of masks. So here, frequently asked questions about wildfire smoke and public health. This one is actually several pages long. Uh, Q&A, you can go through, and I believe it will also lead you to additional information. Many of the things I've already spoken about today are contained in this frequently asked questions document, but it is well worth the time to take a peek at that. Fact sheet, air cleaners, when you may need an air cleaner, what to do to decrease your health risk. Um, is there a do-it-yourself filter option? And then keeping safety tips in mind if you do uh, create a do-it-yourself filter. Hazy, smoky air, do you know what to do? Again, the same things we talked about, limiting your exposure, reducing your time. There you go. A uh, statement from Oregon, OSHA, and OHA on N95, K95, and P100 masks. So people who must be outdoors may be considering the use of masks to help protect their lungs from wildfire smoke. Masks can create a false sense of security if not properly selected, fitted, and used. There are a few things you should know about considering the use of a mask. So click on this, and it's going to go through all of those guidelines from OHA um, and Oregon OSHA about masks that are specific to smoky conditions. 
So wildfire, smoke, and animals, we don't want to leave those out. Uh, just to let you know that Laura Ireland, our animal services director, did a presentation for us. She actually is one of our kickoff presentations for this season. So she has an hour-long presentation just specifically about preparedness for animals, but these are a few slides that we took from that. So as you can imagine, smoke also can affect your pets. As irritating as smoke can be to people, it can cause health problems for animals as well. Smoke from wildfires and other large blazes affects pets, horses, livestock, and wildlife. If you can see or feel the effects of smoke on yourself, you should also take precautions to keep your animals, both pets and livestock, safe. If any of your animals are experiencing any of these signs, please consult your veterinarian. And of course, the veterinarians would tell you everything is in moderation. So yes, your animals may be affected, but it really gets to the point where they are significantly affected is when the, at the time that you would want to put a call into your veterinarian to see if there's something different that you can do or if perhaps there may be um, some assistance that they can provide. So tips to protect your indoors. Not unlike what we're asking for you to do for yourself. So keep pets indoors as much as possible. Keep your door, doors and windows closed. Birds are particularly susceptible and should not be allowed outside when smoke or particulate matter are present. Let dogs and cats outside only for brief bathroom breaks. Avoid intense outdoor exercise. And have your pet evacuation kit ready and include with your animal in your disaster planning. Tips to protect livestock, a little bit more challenging because livestock live outside all the time, but if you can, limit exercise when smoke is visible. Again, that fresh water for all animals. Try to limit dust exposure by feeding low dust or dust-free feeds and sprinkling or misting the livestock holding area. Plan to give livestock four to six weeks to recuperate after the um, smoky conditions have that livestock evacuation plan. And then again, good barn and field maintenance can reduce fire and danger for horses and other livestock and also can uh, limit that amount of extra dust. So a few resources, I won't go too much to this because we're gonna focus um, on the final of the presentation. Uh, your standard run-of-the-mill stuff, Lincoln Alert, seasonal wildfire readiness information, active wildfires for Lincoln County, when to call 911, and those public safety emergency contact numbers, so their business number and the non-emergency non number, resources with the state of Oregon. I did reference the state of California. They uh, have been doing wildfires for a long time, and they have a lot of really good resources for us. Federal and national, ready.gov, National Fire Protection Agency, and your American Red Cross. Okay, so we'll just take a little breather here. I'll get a little drink of water. Okay, so the next module here, access and functional needs, person's preparedness. I will tell you this is the first time that we've actually assembled this type of a preparedness presentation. I queried all of my county emergency managers across the state, the state of Oregon, through Oregon Health Authority, um, as many resources as I could. I looked sort of nationally, and there really wasn't just a one-stop shop presentation that was specifically focused to access and functional needs um, related to wildfire and evacuation. So I would really, um, if you're watching this and you think there's other ideas or things that for your household that you've incorporated that you think that we should include, please reach out to us and let us know because we want to make this a useful presentation to those community members that do um, have access to functional needs so that they're able to um, share this with other individuals and really make it a valued presentation. So again, our administrative overview, uh, we're going to talk about why should access and functional needs individuals prepare, how they can be informed, establishing an emergency support system, developing a plan that works for them, build or update their contact, emergency contact and information, tips for specific disabilities, building or updating your emergency kit, how to evacuate, and then again, some additional resources to help you in your planning. So why prepare? A growing population in Oregon. So we all just participated in the census. Uh, per the U.S. Census Bureau's Population Estimates Program, Oregon was estimated to have a total population just over 4 million people as of July of 2019. 18% of Oregonians are age 65 or older, while 20% are under the age of 18. 9.9% of Oregonians are 65 or younger and have at least one disability as defined on the American Community Survey conducted annually by the U.S. Census Bureau. So it sort of gives you kind of a, you know, 30,000 foot level of what is the demographics of our uh, population here in Oregon. 
So what types of disabilities? Disabilities manifest themselves in varying degrees and the functional implications of the variations are important for emergency evacuation. One person may have multiple disabilities while others may have a disability whose symptoms fluctuate. Everyone needs to have a plan to be able to evacuate a building regardless of their physical condition. The National Fire Protection Association, under the guidance of their Disability Access Review and Advisory Committee, we're going to reference that later on, um, has categorized disabilities into five broad areas, mobility, vision, hearing, speech, and cognitive. So how do we help these community uh, populations stay informed? So first of all, know your community vulnerabilities. What is your community vulnerable? What may affect you if you are a household with an access and functional needs individual? We may have flooding evacuations along our primary rivers. Power outages happen during the wintertime. And now during the summertime, uh, we, may we may anticipate having power outages due to wildfire conditions or uh, pre-risk conditions. Wildfire evacuations, tsunami evacuations, and earthquakes, which would be sheltering in place. So as I put here in the little comment box, some hazards will have a greater impact or longer duration than others. These are our top five Lincoln County vulnerabilities that may affect you. And just so you know, they're just in ran, uh, random order. <laughs> So get to know your community. Neighbors, friends, and coworkers make up 70% of rescuees, uh, rescues in major disasters. So I've put here on the right-hand side our help, oh, pardon me, our map your neighborhood. So that's M-Y-N, map your neighborhood. This is the back page of that. Map your neighborhood is one of the best ways to get to know your neighbors in your community, that uh, what resources they have, how they can help you, and really working together. That's great for all all hazards events or all scenarios, but most specifically, when you're really relying on your neighbors to assist you, like during an evacuation or a shelter in place um, uh, process like an earthquake, then this, this is a way to get to know your neighbors. So alerts and warnings, how do you stay informed? Well, hopefully you have already created a Lincoln Alerts profile where you can put your landline and mobile numbers, either residential or business. That is what we refer to as opt-in profiles where you can put in your landline, mobile, text, and email. Uh, keywords is another access that we have with our Lincoln Alerts program. And this is a way for the cities, the tribe, and the county to be able to distribute community information via text. You don't have to give your name or address, but again, that's just for community information. We really really want you to have your opt-in profile so that we can reach you directly. We do use social media. We have a Sheriff's Office Twitter account and Facebook account, as well as our public health uh, family. And then wireless emergency alerts. This is the ability to disseminate a text message to all wireless phones, cell phones, uh, that are turned on and that this feature has not been disabled. Your phone automatically comes with the emergency alert turned on, so you would actually have to find the right spot in your phone and turn it off. So a good example is, uh, let's say you're on vacation in another state and they have a uh, Amber Alert or a tornado warning. And you're like, how did I get that message? I'm not subscribed to their system. That's the wireless emergency alerts. It's an, actually a federal system that allows public safety and government to send a text message to a geographical area with a very uh, finite or specific um, category of messages. So I couldn't tell you, um, I couldn't send out a message through the wireless emergency alert that the parade was happening on Tuesday, but I could tell you of an Amber Alert if there's a missing child. I could tell you of a, um, a flood warning, uh, wildfire evacuation, all of those criteria where the, act, where the public needs to take action for safety. We also have the emergency alert system, which has the ability for local public safety, emergency management, to disseminate a message directly to the public radio stations. We also have flash alert, which is how many of our public safety agencies distribute media releases about uh, events that are taking place to flash alert, and the media subscribe to it so they get those information or media releases automatically. Your no alert radio um, that also does weather alerts and will also 
also issue fire weather and red flag warnings during those specific weather conditions. And you'll notice down here on the box, I have said that all services are utility dependent, both power and internet. Just know that our Lincoln Alerts program is actually a uh, software provider outside of Lincoln County, and they have a very large framework. So they have multiple locations across the United States. So wherever their hub may be, pardon me, they have other alternate locations. And then same thing with our emergency alert radio, having emergency generators available so that we can still disseminate that information. So again, who's local? There's your map, your neighborhood program again. Uh, consider participating in volunteer groups such as Community Emergency Response Team, Medical Reserve Corps, Auxiliary Communication Service, the Red Cross, et cetera. Um, or just get to know who those folks are. Let them know who you are. These are the folks that are be in and around your neighborhood trying to assist their neighbors during emergencies. Your faith-based community groups, public safety groups, tribal community, and of course, uh, city, county, and tribal emergency management. So what is new? Public safety power shutoffs. How to stay safe when a power outage threatens. So something new to Lincoln County and Oregon is the public safety power shutoffs. What this is referencing is that a condition may occur during severe wire, <laughs> severe weather conditions where the utility service providers see a risk to the utility system grid. We've heard about this in California for pretty much the last three or four years. Um, it is becoming a more regular process in California and also in our southern or central, eastern, and southern counties of Oregon. When those uh, conditions meet a certain, a certain threshold, then the utility providers may shut off power to help prevent wildfire situations. Multiple factors are at play when deciding to shut off the power to communities, but the priority is community safety. There may be some warning or no notice when power is shut off in response to wildfire risk. And that's not necessarily unlike, um, you know, a winter condition where there's a, a vehicle crash, hits a power pole and your power goes out for a few hours. Um, in this case, you would need to anticipate that power may be off uh, for as little as six hours, but even as long as four days, depending on the weather and fire risk conditions. So section D, establishing an emergency support system. It does take a village. A common misunderstanding is that first responders such as police officers, firefighters, and paramedics will be able to provide non-life-saving support during a crisis. Uh, as an example of our Echo Mountain Fire, door-to-door -door notifications and assisting people, it's really in that level three go now life safety where you'll see that fire law enforcement and police officers are actually physically evacuating people to safety. As you're in that level one or level two, we are definitely gonna be referring referring those community members that need to evacuate early to call our call center. But the reality is that friends, coworkers, and neighbors most often are the first people on scene to help you. So who can you identify and work with today to be ready to assist you when an emergency happens? If you don't have one already, develop a caregiver emergency support group. Try to pick at least three people. Think about the proximate proximity of where you live or perhaps where you work. Include in all aspects of your planning. Make sure they know your plan. Make sure they know what your limitations are, that they know where your resources are. And they should have a high level of commitment or trust with you and your family. And then they need to know those details. Where is everything stored? Where's your information? If you change things, you need to make sure that your caregiver, that emergency support group are kept apprised of those changes. Okay, developing your plan. The first thing I want to tell you about developing your plan, there is not one plan. I wish I could just serve to you, okay, here is the golden plan, and this plan is going to work for everyone. But that's not the case. Every family is different. Your household is different. Where you live, access to resources, what your limitations may be. What we really want you to do is look at all of these different options that we're providing for you tonight and really, you know, cherry pick what works for you. You might have this covered or that really doesn't affect you. Go through here and pick the parts and pieces that are going to make a good response evacuation plan for you and your household. Again, there are many options for planning guides. Find the one that is right for you, your family, or your home environment. The next few slides will outline resources and example frameworks for your plan. 
So uh, we're going to list several different entities or agencies that provide information. We're going to start with ready.gov because they are an all hazards uh, information source. They do have a pretty good um, web page with resources specific to individuals with disabilities. They have a great communications, emergency communications plan that's good for everyone in your household. And they have a We Prepare Every Day and We Prepare Every Day uh, video with um, uh, languages and closed caption for those that may be hearing impaired. They also have a Be Informed video, Make a Plan video, and Build a Kit video. And I've referenced here as the graphic, Preparing Makes Sense for People with Disabilities, Others, and with Access and Functional Needs in the whole community. So they really have outlined information specific to this population. So here's that reference again, which we referred from the National uh, Fire yeah, National Fire Protection Agency, uh, Emergency Evacuation Planning Guide for People with Disabilities. This is June of 2016. I've actually looked through it quite a bit over the last several years. First thing I'm going to tell you, it's too big to print. <clears throat> if you are perhaps a group home or an assisted living facility, or you might have multiple individuals in your household with um, access and functional needs limitations, this is going to be a good resource for you to go through to kind of navigate um, conceptual planning concepts. It also really talks about if you are adapting your home for someone that may have a disability, the um, technical side of planning for that individual in your household. It is uh, has a lot of value, but it's very, very lengthy. So it's not a short how to guide. Oh, and here's a table of contents. Uh, building an evacuation plan for people with mobility impairments, uh, visual, hearing, speech, and cognitive. Again, those five areas that we talked about earlier. And then a personal emergency evacuation planning checklist. And again, what you do is you go through all these different resources and find the things that uh, speak to you, that are uh, make sense to you, and might be easy for you to use. Red Cross resources. The Red Cross, again, I found that this was a very valuable resource. I think they've taken the time to really put this in layman's terms or, you know, practical sense. Uh, as I've said here, it's a practical guide for pre, during, and post disaster. It's also available in Spanish. Uh, no two people are the same. This guide will help you assess your abilities and potential conditions you may need to consider in the event of a disaster. You'll also be provided with the key actions and steps to take before, during, and after a disaster or emergency. So a personal emergency plan. I put this one in here because I actually liked it the way that it was laid out. And we would hope that some folks would take the time to fill out a hard copy kind of plan. But honestly, most time we find that people just don't take the time to do it. But if you are one of those people that you take this seriously, and you want to have a good tool for your personal emergency plan, specifically access and functional needs, then this is a very good document for you to use. Um, it includes planning for people with access and functional needs. Having a plan is important for any emergency. View the personal emergency plan, also available in Spanish. And then this emergency supply kit guide, if you click here, uh, if you click here, it will take you to their supply kit guide. Okay, uh, things to consider. Does your plan include a communications plan? Who do you need to communicate to? Uh, also thinking about an individual that is outside of your geographical area, lives in another county or even another state, because sometimes phone calls can get out of state easier than they can get within your own neighborhood. And again, text messages are really much easier to get out uh, than clogging up phone lines. So how would you access your home? How would that individual help you? Can they get into your home? What if you're not at your home and they're just getting some of your emergency uh, medical supplies. Where are your emergency supplies located in your house? Emergency contacts, medical information, evacuation plans, meeting locations. Who are your transportation providers? Do you have that list in your phone book? Do you have a hard copy list? And then again, your caregiver, your caregiver personal family plans. You may have individuals that come into your home to assist you, uh, but they don't live with you. So what are their plans? Are they going to be there? Again, that communication plan is so important to know. Conducting a self-assessment. Anticipate the individual's lowest level of functioning. So when you're thinking about your planning, uh, you might say, great, here's our plan. We're going to walk out the door. We're going to jump in the car. We're going to take off. 
okay, but if you have a family member that has mobility issues that requires um, someone to physically lift them, they may be homebound, then that may be a quick plan, but it's not going to work for everyone in your household. So again, your plan based on that self-assessment is the, is the lowest level of function. You need to identify abilities and resources that you have. What other additional uh, further planning? Do you have the phone number uh, for medical evacuation for ambulance transport handy? You don't want to be looking that phone number up when, when you actually need it. Identifying areas where thir further planning needs are. Uh, include others for a wider perspective. What would this look like in an emergency? What resources are needed? And then down below for persons with dementia and other access and functional needs, preparedness planning needs to be very specific and individualized for that in, for that person. It may require extra levels of planning and time. And that's the reason why we are doing these presentations today to just try to help folks understand the complexity of evacuating with short notice. Other planning considerations, keep a contact list of your support network in a watertight container in your emergency kit. Uh, one of the things that I do is actually put the papers in one of those gallon size Ziploc bags. Um, or now if you're uh, doing the shop, um, oh, you pick up your groceries at home, you'll notice they get these really nice oversized Ziploc bags that your um, soap or your shampoos come in. Those are perfect size Ziploc bags to put important papers in. So that way, if your container comes apart, it falls apart in the back of the car, at least you know your papers are inside a Ziploc bag. Be ready to explain to first responders that you need to evacuate and choose to go to a shelter with your family, service animal, caregiver, personal assistant, as well as your assistive technology uh, devices and supplies. Basically what it's saying is, yes, we're, we want to evacuate, but my family member requires a lot lot of resources when we have to move them. So if you're calling the call center and you're asking for assistance, you need to be um, confident, uh, calm, and explaining what are those components that you need to help evacuate that person. Again, planning for accessible transportation to include how to travel uh, to how to travel to transportation on short notice. And later on, a uh, few more slides, we've got some resources for you. Inform your support team where you keep your emergency supplies. You'll, you'll notice a theme, and I we are kind of reiterating the same thing over and over again, um, but sometimes it takes two or three times for some of that to really hit home. And again, that support team knowing where your supplies are is very important. Other planning considerations, medication and medical equipment considerations. More on this later. And then evacuations, level one or two. If you need assistance to evacuate, you should contact the Lincoln County Call Center, there's the number, to request assistance. If it's a level three and you need immediate life safety assistance, that's when you call 911. And you'll notice here, I've pointed that we do have module four, emergency notifications and evacuations. Uh, an hour long presentation with myself and our patrol division, uh, uh, talking about emergency notifications and evacuations and what to expect when you get the call or when public safety is knocking on your door. Section F, building or updating your emergency contacts and information. Uh, for the next several slides, you're going to see all kinds of examples of how you can uh, store your information, collect your information, and then be able to take it with you. So developing your emergency list, items to include your neighbor contact list, emergency information list, current medical information, your medical history, recent photo of family members and your pets. Once completed, make sure you update this regularly. Pardon me, find a time of year that you're not overly busy like Christmas or holiday, that's not the time to do it. It may be um, daylight savings time. If you think about daylight savings times each year, like you're changing your smoke detectors, same thing. Let's get out our family plan. Let's look at those phone numbers. Let's check our contacts. Let's make sure that everything is up to date. Again, sharing with the entire family and your support group, and then posting those materials in a visible location. You've got one in your Ziploc bag and your go kit, but you may need to have a set on the refrigerator just so that it's handy and you're not ruffling through other papers to try to find it. 
So here's just a simple neighbor contact list, nothing special, but just kind of emphasizing the information you should have. Who is the person, uh, the primary individual that lives there? What's their address? Are they two blocks over, two houses down? You might live in a rural area. So for you, the next door neighbor might be a quarter mile down the road. What are their phone numbers? How do you reach them? And also their email. Email could be beneficial because then you can email your emergency plan to them. And you'll notice in the red area here on the contact list, when did you actually update this information? If you have multiple caregivers that come in to help with your uh, family care, they want to make sure that the list that they're looking at is actually up to date, that it's not two or three years old. And that's a good way to do it by putting that revision date. Emergency information list. So, yep, it does have some very confidential information in here, but unless you're able to take that social security card with you everywhere, you may find that this is the best way to have it. What you could do is maybe just put the last four of your number on here. Many of our agencies uh, reference the last four of your social security number, so that, that could be a way to um, keep that information a little more sensitive. But you'll notice here, again, support group, local emergency contact person, your home phone number, out of contact name, how, how is it best to communicate with you? Uh, they may have a speech impairment, and so perhaps sign language or writing information down. Again, this is just another useful way to help those that are uh, assisting you with your evacuation or when you arrive at a shelter. Your medical information, again, this may be hard to keep up to date. Some households, their medication changes fairly frequently. So it may be that you just might write C, uh, C prescription list rather than marking each one down. But again, this is the type of information that is beneficial for you to be able to take with you. I'm just going to give you an example. We had many people that evacuated um, the north end of the county for the Echo Mountain Fire. They came to the Red Cross shelter, but they really had a medical need not so much to go to the hospital, but they did need assistance and they may not have had their caregivers with us or with them. So we had the Medical Reserve Corps group uh, volunteers who set up the Medical Fragile Shelter, which we have a presentation for that as well. I think that was presentation five. And um, so in that presentation, we talk about when you get there, they need as much information as possible because you may not have your caregivers with you or they might be with you for a little while, then they have to go take care of um, their their family as well. So the more information you're able to pack with you to give to that next caregiver is really um, good for you. So here's just another example, emergency information form for children with special needs. Uh, again, this is just an example of information, how you would fill out the form. I believe if you click on this, uh, it should take you to that resource as an example. But again, this is just example of information that you should have for minors. Emergency identification. Do you have a wrist uh, alarm, pardon me, a wrist identification explaining what your uh, disability or your impairment may be, your emergency ID card. I know there's necklaces that are available. Uh, these are all very beneficial resources, again, when you're working with first responders or individuals that may not know you. Tips for specific disabilities. <laughs> Excuse me. Using assistive mobility equipment, think about backup of equipment. Do you have an alternative? Does it rely on power? Practice independent transfers. Uh, strength of support of the staff that are there to assist you. Do you know how to operate equipment or how to assemble it? Do you always rely on someone else to put your equipment together for you? Did they leave you instructions to put in your go kit? Is there a picture diagram of how that equipment goes together or perhaps how it needs to be cleaned effectively? If you're blind or low vision, practice various exits, wayfinding methods, and alternative alert methods. Have that extra pair of glasses, canes, or other aids that you might need as a backup. Hearing impairments and limitations, keeping extra batteries for hearing aids with emergency supplies, alternative alert methods, and a communication plan. Uh, just keep in mind, we know that uh, batteries die, and even at our medical fragile shelter over the Labor Day fires, if you arrive and you have hearing aids, but your batteries die, we're going to send somebody to Walgreens to get you some new batteries. But having an extra set in your go bag could be very beneficial. 
communication disabilities. Store paper, writing materials, copies of other word or letter boards that could assist you or those that are helping you. Think about having pre-printed key phrases. I cannot speak, but I do hear and understand. I use a communication device. I can point to simple pictures or key words. Please use short direct statements. Having those pre-printed so you can show them to responders or other caregivers, again, just useful. Uh, all of these things are useful things to help with your transition when you're evacuating or going to a new location. Emergency communication for all. This is a picture communication aid. Uh, you can point to parts of a body. Uh, you can point to numbers, point where it hurts. You can use these picture diagrams to try to communicate to uh, the individual that um, you're assisting. This is good for both the responder. I believe most response agencies already have these available, but it may be, again, your neighbor that's assisting you. Cognitive intellectual disabilities. Practice leaving places where individual spends time. Practice communication. Make it part of the routine. Comfort items. Um, thinking about, uh, I have kids, so thinking about my when my kids were young and they were having to go to the doctor's office or go to the dentist. The more I uh, sort of desensitized them to the fact that they're going to have to get in the car on an urgent basis, they're going to have to go somewhere new, um, the more you make it a normal process, then that reduces the risk, pardon me, it reduces their stress. They be, may be more accommodating, they may be more assistive to that. Anything that you can do to make it not so stressful, then that will benefit in and, um, and also um, in, uh, limit the time that it takes you to safely evacuate your household. Building or updating your emergency kits. And again, this is good for everyone. Preparedness from where you are. Your needs may differ greatly if an emergency happens while you're asleep or if it happens while you're awake at home. Sometimes an emergency may occur while traveling. It may be worth carrying a simple kit with you throughout the day, but if you need to evacuate your home, what would you need if you can't return quickly? And definitely the year 2020 provided many examples from the survivors across all of our fires in Oregon about how much time they had, what limited items they were able to take with them, if they had prepared items in advance, and what they wish they really would have been able to take with them had they known they weren't coming back to their house or knowing that they had to go to a sheltering uh, service. So emergency kits. Everyone you care for should have personalized and specific supplies based on functional and their access need. Store them where they're easily accessible. And again, here's just an example for you. Uh, this one here is from the Information Guidance and Training on the Americans with Disability Act. It's several pages long, and it goes into great detail on each of these different areas. Again, self-learning module, click on the button, find more information, and read through those things that are important to you or where you might need to brush up on. Three types of emergency kits. Um, a home kit, something you're going to shelter in place with, and maybe you lose power and that's your power outage kit. Uh, To-go kit, smaller and more portable. Again, for this particular presentation, we're talking about those items that are specific to that individual that has access and functional needs. And then also a community kit. That could be something that's larger. Uh, your neighborhood association may have a cache of emergency supplies. So again, Thinking about your situation, where you may be evacuating, or if you have to shelter at home, then you may have a, different kits for different purposes. People ask us all the time, just tell me what I need to have in my kit. That's all I want to know. Just give me the list. Well, there isn't the list. Just like I talk about in our Cascadia presentations, there isn't the list. The list is really what's important to you and what are you willing to live without. Um, I'll take uh, coffee, for example. If we were in a moderate earthquake and you had to shelter in place or you were away from home and you might be addicted to uh, caffeine from coffee drinks, well, you're going to get caffeine headaches if you don't have your caffeine products. So you can actually buy caffeine pills that you put in your kit. So if you don't have access to your favorite uh, coffee beverage, then you would have those to sort of wean yourself off. Now that may not be a very good example for our access and functional needs populations, but hopefully it kind of gets you. What's important to you? What do you really need? 
what are some things that you don't really need? And again, keep it to the basic essentials, the things that are going to keep you going for at least 72 to 96 hours while you are away from home. If you've made your way to one of our Red Cross shelters or to our Medical Fragile shelter, then you're going to start off with your own items and then we're going to augment those things that you need, such as nutrition, food, water, um, medical supplies, a place to sleep, warm blankets. And I always tell people, if you can squeeze it into your bag, take a pair of uh, pajamas and at least one good pair of socks, because there's nothing better when you're sleeping somewhere strange that you've got your own set of pajamas and a fresh, clean pair of socks. Well, maybe underwear too. So anyways, take what you can, but keep it simple and keep it lightweight. If you have room in your vehicle, you might actually be able to store those extra items uh, that you would need on a lengthier evacuation time period. Some you're not just going to grab and go and walk into a shelter maybe you know 10 10 10 or 12 hours later so they've listed out a few items here i'm not going to go through each one you can look at those other considerations okay we said we were going to talk a little bit more about medications and this is a very important aspect for many of our seniors and especially uh, anyone that has a chronic medical condition uh, again we've provided here from uh, centers for disease control i found that they really had sort of the best uh, resource guide about uh, prescription medications this one is referred to as prescriptions prepare your medicine cabinet for an emergency so that was kind of uh, i hadn't seen this one before. So they talk about your prescription medications, one in four, take three or more a day, uh, what you can do with your physician, how you can kind of um, stockpile is really not the word we're supposed to use, but you know what I mean. You're, you're building up your supply because it's challenging to get more from your insurance providers. Order refills as early as possible. They have copies of your prescription, the name, the address, and phone number of the provider. Because if you come to your medical fragile shelter or even the Red Cross shelter and you don't need medical care, but you don't have your really important medications, um, either of those services are going to work with you to contact your doctor, work through the process, and then get you those medications that you need while you are there uh, during sheltering services or until you can return home. So again, this is a great resource that you can look at to help kind of plan out uh, what your process will be. Medical equipment. Uh, having the model make and name of the medical equipment that you use. Uh, we may have to purchase something or you may have to purchase something. You may have to rent something if you um, were away from home and you can't get back to your house to get that key medical equipment. Uh, if you have that list with you all the time, then you're not sort of guessing and trying to go from memory. Well, it was this or it was that. That way we've got it right there. Another thing that we can do too, if it is a a prescribed medical equipment, we'll be able to contact or help you contact your physician's office to find out what it is. But again, having the list with you, very, very helpful. Find alternatives if you typically rely on equipment to communicate, such as laminated cards, pictures, or pictograms. Going to reference that again. And then what backup options do you have if you lose power for your medical equipment? And here's that uh, slide that goes right along with that. Uh, consider registering with your power company. They may have a process for those that are um, have disabilities, access and functional needs. Talk with equipment suppliers. Are there, um, can you run it off of a battery? Uh, how long will it go if it has its own backup battery? Plan for alternate power sources, generator, plan how to recharge your batteries. Regularly check alternative power supply. If you do working off of a generator or a battery, uh, teach support groups how to operate and safely move your equipment. Again, uh, instruction cards are very valuable. So if you do have to use a generator, maybe it's during one of those public safety power shutoff times or even a winter storm, uh, We've put on here our page to our public safety power shutoffs for more information, but this was a great generator uh, information sheet from the National Fire Protection Agency. It's kind of hard to read on the slide right now. I get that. But when you have the slide and you're looking at them and you click on this, uh, it'll blow up and it'll it'll be easy to read. Um, again, fire protection and safety at the home, using a generator is key to safety. So how to evacuate for wildfire conditions. For level one, be ready. Level two, be set. Level three, go. Those are statewide evacuation levels. We have an entire module that I talked about already, emergency notification and evacuations. If you click on this, it should lead you, yep, it'll lead you right to that presentation so that you can review that. Again, it's about 45 minutes long and it goes through A through Z about what to expect. 
So, um, but the bare minimum, evacuation is what you need to know. There are many resources that identify tasks or steps to take when you receive a level one or level two notice, but importance is on how much time will it take you to safely pack up your essential items, your family and pets, then leave. Practice how long it will take you to prepare your household to evacuate. Focus on improving those steps to be ready to go at a moment's notice. Will you need assistance in evacuating? Some community members may not have transportation and will need to rely on friends, family, neighbors, or request assistance. And to do that, you call the county call center. Can you assist your neighbors? They may need help to leave or check to see if they too have received the evacuation notice. Here's the information on our call center. Again, put that phone number in your contacts. If you do need help and or you're unable to evacuate yourself, family, pets, or livestock, if you are in a level one or a level two, try family, friends, and neighbors, and then call the county call center. If you're at a level three, call the call center, or if it is a life safety threat, you know the fire is there, uh, it happened very quickly, there isn't time to contact family, there isn't time to call the call center, then that is the time to call 911. Help OK signs. Every household in Lincoln County, we hope that you have a help OK sign. If you don't, you should be able to stop at any fire district, city, tribal office, and they should have these available for you. It really is a way to communicate to responding public safety officials if your household is OK or if this household is going to need help evacuating. Now, just keep in mind, we will stop at every house and do door-to-door -door notifications and make sure that you're really OK. But if we see two houses, one has an OK okay and one has a help, we're going to go to the help house first because they're going to require additional assistance to evacuate. And what I would like to point out down here on the bottom of your help okay sign, uh, we have the color, pardon me, we have the level one, two, and three outlined as to what their definitions mean. Um, everyone is nervous when you get a call from public safety. We get Lincoln Alerts calls. We did our annual test um, back in May. But if first time you get that real call and they say you are at evacuation level two, uh, be set. You're nervous, you're tense. We'll repeat it more than once on the call, but you'll be like, what, what was a level two? What does it mean? Go back to your help okay sign and that's where you'll have that definition. And then also uh, the call center phone number, um, I think is linked right there. So that's another way to help you. So level one, be ready review. Be aware of changing conditions and monitor for updated information. Begin precautionary evacuation steps for persons with special needs, pets, livestock, or if you're thinking of taking your mobile equipment, you really need to do that early because you get to a level two and level three, you could actually be congesting the highways by taking additional vehicles and RVs with you. If time allows, check on neighbors. Again, begin preparing your house and property for evacuation. If you need assistance, call the call center. If conditions worsen, public safety will issue an upgrade to a level two or a three for that area. And keep in mind, you may go from a level one directly to a level three. That is all based on fire behavior and weather conditions and resources of the fire officials. So a level two, <clears throat> pardon me, be aware of changing conditions, continue to monitor. You must be prepared to leave at a moment's notice. Uh, you may still be preparing your household for evacuation, but you really need to be ready to be in the car and out the door. <clears throat> If time allows, do check on those neighbors. If conditions worsen, public safety will issue an upgrade to a level three and will make every attempt to return to this location to do door-to-door -door notifications for that level three if it's upgraded. So a level three, <coughs> pardon me, be aware of changing conditions. You must leave immediately when a level three is issued. And the first, the first evacuation level you get might actually be a level three. Fire initiates, it's just over two blocks over, it's spreading very quickly, you get the call, and next thing you know, you see fire or law enforcement officials knocking on your door telling you, go now. There's no time to prepare, there's no time to grab anything, you get in your vehicle if you have one and you leave. If you don't have a vehicle and you have no other way to evacuate, that's when you call 911. If you do choose to ignore this notice, public safety officials may not be available to assist you further. This may be the last notice you receive until the notice is canceled or downgraded. Once they do their door-to-door -door notifications, if you've decided to stay, it is not likely that fire or law enforcement will be able to go back into that level three area to help you evacuate. 
So where do you go when you do evacuate? Some terms I'd like for you to be familiar with is temporary evacuation point or a TEP that's sort of new that came about due to COVID conditions in 2020 uh, from the American Red Cross across the entire nation. However, even though COVID conditions are lifting, we are going to keep this terminology as part of our evacuation plan, us in many, many areas. Pardon me. And what that means is that when you get that initial evacuation, the Red Cross shelter may not be established yet. It can take anywhere from two to six hours for a full Red Cross shelter to be set up. So what we will do is a temporary evacuation point, which is a large parking lot area. Uh, we're in the process now of training additional Red Cross members and our community emergency response team members. So they will be there. We have uh, resources available to set that up. You'll basically stay in your car. We're assuming those folks are coming by car and then you'll get information and then that's sort of a staging area until the shelter can be established. It will also be a point to get up to date information as to what is happening with the fire. Also, another term is receiving facility. This is a temporary location to gather until shelters are set up. Most likely this might be a fire station or a community building, not a full shelter, but it is a place to catch your breath, get information, use the facilities and maybe get some uh, refreshments. You could also go to friend or family members uh, home outside of the evacuation area. You might choose a motel or hotel or if you were able to take your uh, RV with you, a campground. And then when shelters are set up, we have American Red Cross shelters. There may be another uh, community shelter or again, the medically fragile shelter where we might find those with ac uh, access and functional needs that require medical care, but not the hospital. That's where you'll go. So review module five, sheltering. Again, uh, sheltering with medically fragile persons. This would be the one that we just did last week with the American Red Cross. So take a look at that. We'll go in more detail as to what to expect when you arrive or what you need to bring with you. Ah, okay, catching my breath. So now additional resources, a little bit more resources uh, than under air quality. I found this on the state of California's webpage. I thought it was pretty um, helpful. It's more specific to those public safety power shutoff events, um, but I like the way that it was laid out. It was short, it was simple, it was a one pager. It talks about all of the different things that we've already talked about. So this could be something that you could print off and kind of do that self-assessment if you're not gonna take the time to do a full lengthy one. So again, uh, Lincoln County resources, state of Oregon, state of California. And now you'll see just a few more federal and national resources here. Uh, that American Red Cross Emergency Preparedness for Older Adults, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Prepare Your Medicine Cabinet, Map Your Neighborhood, Emergency Evacuation Planning Guide for People with Disabilities. So I'll catch my breath here. I'm just going to take a quick look to see if we had any chats on the thing tonight. So I'll just pause for a second. And then we're going to finish our presentation tonight. I will share the Lincoln County Wildfire Readiness Public Safety Service announcement. That will be our conclusion for our presentation tonight. So if you've already watched the video, um, the, uh, the public service announcement, you can drop off. You don't need to watch it again. But if you haven't watched, I would really encourage you to do so. Um, it's got some good points from your local public safety officials, Sheriff Curtis Landers, our Fire Defense Board with Chief Rob Murphy and Chief Rob Dahlman, both respectively from Newport Fire and North Lincoln Fire. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat and I see some participants there. So thank you very much for tuning in tonight. We do appreciate that support. And bear with me just a second here and I'm going to bring over the public safety service announcement and I'm going to get it in the queue. And so I'm going to take myself off camera and I'm going to mute myself and say thank you and I'll play this and hope you have a good night. Wildfire cannon does happen here and we all need to prepare for it. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing to the public is be aware, be aware, be prepared, know what happens around you, know what happens in the community, uh, listen to local radio, local media, um, sign up for Lincoln Alerts uh, so that you have the most time, the best chance of getting early notification if we need to evacuate. Uh, I think something the general public 
uh, unless they've been through this, never really uh, fully appreciates is how fast it spreads and how it can go from nothing to uh, a firefighter or a sheriff's, uh, 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 sheriff's deputy knocking on your door saying, get out now. Sometimes, while we have a great system and we have the ready, set, go, sometimes it goes straight to go. I mean, that's just the reality because of how fast these fires spread. And so the time to start thinking about what do I do in a wildfire isn't when somebody's knocking on your door. That's probably the biggest lesson, I think. The time to start thinking about it, to start planning with your family, to ha know what you're going to do is really now. And that's why we're doing these messages, because we want people to think about this now, because in August, in September, is you, you, should already, you should already know what you're going to do. Yeah, Link Alert should be uh, very much a, a priority in what they're preparing for, for their plans. It's a direct communication. Uh, a lot of, you know, we heard a lot of things, communication wasn't good or wasn't acceptable during this last event. And uh, we know that Lincoln Alerts is one of the things that continued to work and was, uh, was um, providing information, timely information, to all the residents in the area. And uh, one of the things that residents can do is make sure that their Lincoln Alerts is up to date, that they have their, their phone numbers in properly, that their cell phones are in there. If you want to know about a neighbor or, or family member around, you can put their address in. And, and there's lots of tools and things you can do to be alerted uh, in the event of not just wildfire, but any event, any emergency event that goes on, it's, it's an excellent tool. And uh, that's one of the first priorities uh, citizens should do is, is have that all up to date. So your, your personal preparedness is have a plan of what to do um, if you have to evacuate. And, and this can be applied not just to fire season, but also if we have other natural disasters that come on. Uh, it, pay attention to what's going on. No know when those alerts come out, be part of and, and subscribe to the Lincoln Alert System and make sure that you have, if you were to walk into your, into your house and say, I've got five minutes to grab my most essential items, what would I take? What would be important? If you're at a level one or a level two evacuation for a wildland fire, have those things already gathered up and in your car. Have your birth certificates, your important documents, um, your computer heart, computers, anything that you say, I need to, I can't live without this. Have that stuff at the door ready to go or in your car ready to go. I'm just really proud to be uh, part of this community and part of the response that, that goes into it uh, between the county, between the cities, the different fire districts. Um, it, it goes all hand in hand and it's a very collaborative approach to these disasters. and. It's also because of, you know, we're prepared well. Um, you know, Jenny Damaris, our county emergency manager, prepares us every year, prepares the community as we're doing here with, uh, with information, but it's working together. That's the only way that we'll succeed and, and we do very well at it. Visit Lincoln County's website to view the 2021 Wildfire Readiness Presentation Schedule. These are live events that you can attend via Zoom and ask questions, or you can watch them live streamed on YouTube. There are six subject matter areas and one event per each fire district. So if you can't make it in person, rest assured, we will archive these online for you to review. When you get to the website, just use the search tool or look for the text that says, Wildfire Readiness Presentations. Thank you.